It is my distinct honor to bring him to you and to ask you at this time, will you help me to receive our great leader, teacher, and guide, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Help me, dear family, to receive him. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Here he is. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his mercy and his goodness to the human family. The greatest of God's mercies is that he sends into the world prophets and messengers to reveal hidden truths about himself and about his creation to help to evolve human beings toward perfection. We thank Allah for Moses and the Torah. We thank him for Jesus and the Gospel. We thank him for Muhammad and the Quran. Peace be upon these worthy servants of Allah. I am a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and I could never thank Allah enough for his intervention in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad to whom praise is due forever for his raising up among us one to lead, teach and guide us into that process that would make us what Allah intended for us to be when he created the human being. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Let me say how thankful to Allah I am that he blessed me to be among you once again and thankful to Allah for the presence of each and every one of you especially the believers who have fasted this weekend My thanks to you for doing that which will make us a better people. In the Holy Quran, which is the book of scripture of the Muslims or the righteous, Allah says fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you. Whenever a people break down and lose themselves, it is because of a lack of discipline that allows the human being to be tempted to do that which is outside of the natural sphere of his life. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. When we go outside of the nature in which God created us, then we go into death 
that death is not necessarily a physical death, but it is the erosion of your ability to see, to hear, to speak, to vision, and to bring what we vision into reality. That's death. So when God prescribes fasting, which means you deny yourself something very natural, which is food. We all need food to live. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us food keeps you here and food takes you away. Anything that you do in extreme will hurt you. Extreme fasting will kill you. Extreme eating will kill you too. So we have to find the balance. So when God asks the righteous to fast in a world like this, and to deny ourselves what our bodies need for nourishment, then that fasting produces a discipline. Because if you can stay away from what you naturally need to live, then you can discipline yourself to stay away from that which is against your life. Smoking, drinking, the use of drugs, now, fornication and adultery is based on a natural thing. The hunger of the male for the female and the female for the male. But adultery and fornication destroys the social fabric of a community. So does gossiping, lying, slander, backbiting, cheating, stealing. These are things that destroy the social fabric of a community. So if you can deny yourself food, then you can stop lying. If you can deny yourself food, you can stop slander. You can stop gossip. And as powerful as sex is, through fasting, you can gain the discipline to come away from fornication and adultery which erodes family life, destroys marriage, destroys a nation. So fasting is prescribed for us. Fasting is a prescription from the supreme doctor, God himself. So I am so thankful to be among the believing community that will attempt, even if you didn't make it, if you attempt it, that's fine. I remember when I first fasted three days, it was kind of rough on me, and I was a young man, 22 years of age, but I struggled. And when I made that first fast, it was like I had conquered Mount Everest. <laughs> and when you can fast, it makes you feel like, oh, I can do a lot of things that I didn't think I could do. So I thank you, all of you who have fasted, and I encourage all of you to eat according to the dietary teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, I know that the Quran gives us the foods to eat. This is a true book, a good book. However, it also teaches us 
that Allah is going to raise a messenger. Now listen carefully and teach, teach him Al-Kitab, the book. What is this Quran called? The book. Not only will he teach him the book, but he'll teach him the wisdom. What is that? If this is a book full of wisdom and he's going to teach him the book and then and he's going to teach him the wisdom, mm. then he's going to teach him the Torah and the gospel. So when you represent the Messiah, you have to speak from all of the revealed words of God that bear witness to the truth that the messenger will bring. He says the messenger will not only open the eyes of the blind by God's permission, make the deaf hear and the dumb speak by Allah's permission, but he will raise the dead to life by Allah's permission. Now anytime a human exercises the power that is only relegated to God, Allah, one of Allah's names in the Quran is the giver of life. Another one of Allah's names is the raiser of the dead. Now if Allah gives life and can raise the dead and a human born of a woman opens the eyes of the blind not by his own power but by Allah's permission makes the deaf hear and the dumb speak by Allah's permission raises the dead to life by Allah's permission then Allah has put his spirit in that man mm. then it says he will teach them what foods to eat and what foods to store in their houses. Well, this Quran is full of teaching on food. But this messianic figure will go beyond the Quran and teach you what foods to eat and what foods to store in your house as a compliment to what is written in the book. Let's think about it. Now, so if in the Bible the one who comes at the end of the world comes that we may have life and have it more abundantly then that one who gives you life in abundance has to teach you the best foods to put in your mouth and how to raise those foods and since we know that the food merchants in this world are the merchants of death They have corrupted the earth, corrupted that which comes from the earth. They have poisoned the fish and the meat. So when you eat, you're eating life and death. When you eat from the hand of the merchants of death. Huh? So if you don't have a way to eat, that helps you cleanse your blood from the natural poisons that are in the best of food. Not to think of food that's already poisoned by the enemy trying to fatten the calf or the lamb or the pig or whatever you eat, fatten it by introducing hormones that are against the good health 
of the animal. So if we feed ourselves on this corrupted meat, corrupted fish, corrupted vegetation, then if you don't have a way to purify yourself, then the poisons will continue to build in your body, build in your blood, be transported to the cells of your brain, and you will find yourself unable to think clearly, unable to vision, and above all, you won't live long enough to bring what you vision into reality. He came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Today, I'm here because this week, no, last week, I woke up early in the morning for my prayers and a thought came to me that I, I had to come out and talk to you about. And I want to thank our brothers and sisters who may be listening in London and Paris and in Ghana and in the Caribbean and those who are watching by webcast in about 120 cities in these United States. I pray that what God allows me to say to each of you today will be a blessing to you. Now, the thought that came to me that I had to come out and talk to you about was this oft-repeated word in the Quran, the hereafter. This book, Quran, over and over again, from the second surah to the 75th surah, continuously mentions the hereafter. And it says that those who don't believe in the hereafter and take the life of this world as their great desire, they will be chastised in this world and in the hereafter. Now that puzzled me because I wanted to know how would they get in the hereafter to be chastised if the hereafter is for those who are the righteous. Now come on. We got we to gotta talk about this. So I first started by looking up in the dictionary a meaning for the word hereafter. Well, some uh, definitions say a future life, something coming in the future. But then, this definition said, life after death. The life after death. Okay. Now, most of us, you can't be a Muslim, except you believe in the divine revelation and the hereafter. You can't even be a good Christian if you don't believe that there's a better life coming than the life that we presently live. Come on. All right. Now, we need to plumb the depth of that as quick as we can in the short time we're going to be together so that we can look forward to 
a better life than the life that we presently are practicing. The Holy Quran opens in the second chapter called the cow in these words Alif la me this I Allah am the best Noah that's wonderful that Allah introduces himself to us as not one who has knowledge but one who is the best Noah of all who possess it. He says, this book, Quran, there is no doubt in it. Now that's quite a statement. Because I read a lot of books, and I'm sure you do too. But I have never read a book that opens declaring this book there is no doubt in it it is a guide to those who eschew evil or who guard against evil now if you don't want to guard against evil this is not your book if you like the doing of evil, you leave this book alone. This is not yours. But if you want to escape the consequences of evil and you desire to be guided aright, then this book, there is no doubt in it, is a guide to those who keep their duty who guard against evil, who believe in the unseen. I'm going to stop right there. Now look. People say, I only believe what I can see. But you can't see the molecules of air. But you believe that it exists and if you doubt its presence, just let somebody choke you for a few minutes. You'll be a believer in the unseen real quick. Please let some of the unseen come into me. So there's a whole world beyond the world that you can see. And the most powerful world is the unseen world that bears on what you see. Now you don't see my spirit. You feel it. You see a man in whom the spirit is. But the unseen is what's moving the tongue. The unseen is what's guiding the mouth. So when God speaks to humanity, he speaks of things present that you can see. And he speaks of things to come which you can't see. But a believer in God trusts his word. And even though what he has prophesied has not come into existence, yet we believe it, and we believe in him whom we have not seen. It didn't mean he is not present. It just said he's unseen. That's, that's pretty good. But if you believe in the unseen, then there are principles that you have to practice that shore up your faith. You must keep up prayer. 
Now, Allah says in the Quran, he would not even care for us were it not for our prayers. And for God to give us so much and all he asks of us, remember to pray. And then, you know, when the disciples came to Jesus and said, Master, teach us how to pray. That's like asking, you know, who's your favorite football player, your favorite basketball player, your favorite movie actor, your favorite person? Can I have their phone number, please? Now, if you had a phone number to your favorite person, would you call it? Suppose you were poor and you had Rockefeller's number. Would you call it? Hey, Rock. If you had Bill Gates' number, would you call it? Well, now, if a disciple asked the teacher, Master, teach us not what to say, but how to pray. Oh, brother, he's giving you the phone number to reach God. And then God don't leave you to make up words. You can do that, but he first wants you to say the oft-repeated prayer called Al-Fatiha. Al-Fatiha comes from an Arabic root, Miftah, which means a key. So in the oft-repeated prayer of the Muslims is the key to open up everything else you may want. Now, when you have a key, you got to know where the door is. Somebody dies and leaves you the key to the safe deposit box, and you don't even know what bank it's in. Well, you're in bad shape. You just got a key, but don't know where to put it. It's the key to open the treasure of God's wisdom, God's mercy, his forgiveness, his abundance, and his ability to make each of his creatures secure. So it starts like this. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name or with the help of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, you're forced to say these attributes to remind you of who you're talking to. Not just somebody, but he's the beneficent. Go home and look that word up in your dictionary. He's not only the beneficent, but he is the merciful. And all of us need the beneficence and the mercy of God every day. In fact, every minute and every second and every millisecond of the day. Now look at this. Then the first verse of Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. This book, Quran, if you get a key to open God's wisdom, it raises the student to eminence. You come from nothing and God raises you to greatness. Not for you to become arrogant and vain, but for you to recognize that it is God who has raised you. So you say, Alhamdulillah, praise. All of it belongs to God. Nothing that you do, no talent that you have, no gift that you possess, no possession that you have, 
is from you. So whatever you have to God is the glory. To God is the praise. And if you and I can humble ourselves to give God the praise, then part of our prayer says, surely Allah answers him who praises him. See? Then you say, he's not only wants me to praise him, but why? Because he's Rabbil Alameen. He's the one who initiates creation. Then he nurtures creation, making it evolve making stage after stage until it reaches perfection. That's why we should say, Alhamdulillah, because he's Rabbil Alameen. Then you have to say it again, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. He's the beneficent, the merciful. Now, Maliki Yawmiddi. He's master, not a judge. See, a judge that sits on the bench, the judge got to do what the law prescribes. Who you're praying to is the master of the law. Meaning he can bring down the full weight of the law that we have transgressed on us, or he can minimize it or take it away completely. That's who I'm praying to. <laughs> I want me a God that masters the law of requital. Master of the day of judgment. Master of the day of religion. Maliki Yawmiddi, where he makes his truth triumph over falsehood. Mm. Then look at this, these words. Guide thee alone, pardon me. Do we worship thee alone, nobody else? You don't set up no rival, no partner, no nothing. Thee alone do we worship. And thine aid we seek. So guide us on the straight path. I don't want to be crooked. I want to get my crooked life straight. So if I want my crooked life to become straight so I can benefit from being straight or right or correct, you can't do it on your own. Allah has to guide you to that path. And evidently we lost our way. That's why the Bible calls us the lost sheep. If you were on the straight path of God, we would not be in the condition that we're in. In fact, in the straight path of God, you laugh at a white man trying to rule you. You literally laugh at it. Because once you know God, can nobody rule you except who you surrender to. I'm coming to something. I'm coming to something. It's silly for us to look to the white man to give us what he can't give. The white man can't give you freedom. Why not? Then if you understand what freedom is, he can free you from a chain that he put on you, sure. 
That's not freedom. That's just releasing you from physical bondage. That's the, hey, he could do that. In fact, he did it. But you're still a slave. So hell, don't talk about I'm free. See, you're free. In fact, the son, Al-Shams, it's called in Arabic. The sun is the emblem of freedom. You can't have freedom without light. In fact, without the light of the sun, nothing can come from the darkness out of a womb into light. So nobody can be free if you're ignorant. You didn't hear me. You, you didn't hear. An ignorant person is somebody's slave. And the enemy, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us in our lessons, he wants to keep you ignorant so he can continue to use you as a tool and as a slave. How can you be free and don't know God? How can you be free and don't know yourself? How can you be free and don't know the enemy of yourself? Now you all running around here thinking that all creatures are from the one God. He didn't say that. That argument was among the Jews. They were arguing with Jesus in the book of John. Go read it. Say, God is our father, even Abraham. And Jesus said, well, if Abraham were your father, you would do the works of Abraham. Then he came back even stronger. He said, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth. Leave the brother alone, brother. You want to sleep? It's all right. If he can sleep on this, let him sleep. I'll wake him up some way down the line <laughs> with Allah's help. Saturday night is a rough night for black folk to get you up in the morning, to get you out of your hangover from last night. That's pretty good that you out here at 10 o'clock in the morning. I thank you for coming. <clears throat> Y'all all right? Where was I? Yeah, Jesus said, got even stronger. He said, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth from God. Then he said, and now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth. Then he gets even stronger. He said, I know you. Don't, don't pull no jive on me. I'm a hip Jesus. I know you. Look at this. <laughs> he said, I know you. You are of your father, the devil. Now here you got another father here. You got God the father, and the devil is a father too. So you got to ask yourself, whose child are you? Come on now, listen. Come on. We're going to talk today. We're not going to be long. <laughs> Look. <clears throat> he said, I know you. You are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you shall do. For your father was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And he abode not in the truth. 
That's Jesus. You see, Satan been hiding. And he had us hoodwinked, bamboozled. <laughs> But this Jesus, he peeped him. He knew him. But hey, hey, I know you. You stop hiding him. Using Abraham's name and God's name to shield yourself. I know you, dude. You are of your father, the devil. Now, in the book of Job, the devil is going up and down to and fro in the earth seeking whom he may devour. Now if the devil is eating people, if the devil is eating people, then his aim is to bring the whole of humanity under his sway. Now the devil ain't going to do that by saying, you know I'm the devil. He, he can't be a master deceiver by telling the truth. I'm the devil. So he has to make himself appear like an angel of light. See, the only way you can be deceived is by somebody coming in the name of one whom you respect. And you naturally respect God. So some of the greatest deceivers come in religion. How else are you going to trick the people? Um, I had a dream last night, and God spoke to me, and I came out today to speak to you. I didn't tell you I had no dream. I didn't tell you I heard nobody talk. I just woke up, and the thought was in my head about the hereafter. So, I said, let me go out. Now, I tried to read a lot of things. I, I tried to study, but, you know, hey, hey, just have to come out and stand up. So I decided, well, Allah, in my prayers this morning, in my position of sajda, I begged Allah to be with my mouth and to fill me with his spirit and to put his light above me, beneath me, and around me, and through me. And I don't know how I look to you, but I, I can tell you, I know you looking at light. I know that. <laughs> so the, the enemy has eaten up a world of people. So the book said Job came to present himself to God. And he came with the sons of God. And when he got to God thinking he was in good company, God said, Whence cometh thou, Satan? I imagine Job was shook. I, I didn't know I was hanging out with Satan. Now that's something. You hanging out with somebody. You think they're your ace, boon coon, as they used to say. Or your top dog uh, in the vernacular of today. My dog. And your dog is a dog. Satan. You walking with him. Mm. Devoured by him and have become a part not of the body of Christ 
Because if you were a part of the body of Christ, your words, your actions would reflect Christ. But our words and our actions reflect the very opposite of Christ. Talk to me. So then we have been devoured by Satan, but he comes in the noble name of Jesus. In the noble name of Allah. In the noble name of Muhammad or Abraham. But he couldn't put that small time stuff over on Jesus. We're the seed of Abraham. He said, yeah, right. I know you. Now, what I'm about to say is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad asked the question, hereafter, hereafter what? I think that's a good question. If you want to be in the hereafter, hereafter what? Well, if it's a life after death, let's examine that from the Quran and from the Bible. Remember now, the messianic figure, he got to know something from the book, the wisdom, the Torah, the gospel. So both books bear witness to the truth of the hereafter. All right. Now, if the hereafter is a life after death, and the Quran calls the life of this world a life of sport and play, the Quran calls this world's life a transitory life. When you're in transit, you started from a location, but you're on your way to a destination, and transit means you are on your way. You haven't reached there yet. So this life is called a transitory life. All right? A life of sport and play. This world's life. And the Quran speaks of those who seek gold and material things. Well, God can give you the best of this world, but if you want the life of the hereafter, which is the better life, he said, I'll give you the best in this world and the best in the life to come. Let's start now by analyzing death. Because if we can analyze death and come to an agreement from Bible and Quran on what death is, then we can better understand a life after death. Now, look. How many of you have been to a funeral in your life? That's everybody. Now, when one expires and the breath goes out, this body is the shell of that life. It's the shell that that life manifested in. Agree? When death comes, the essence of life goes out or the body is too weak to bring it in. So if this brother, I start choking him, and I choke real good, It ain't that something went out. It's that something failed to come in to keep him alive. You got the picture? Okay. Now, 
when the body is too weak to bring in the breath of life, the person has expired. Right? Okay. Now, I don't care how much you love them, and you know you love them, but you're not going to leave your wife in the bed after she dead. You go to sleep, or your husband, he dead, and we're going to sleep together. That won't last too long. <laughs> Something about death. When that body starts to first rigor, you know who rigor is? I didn't say nigger, I said rigor. When rigor steps in, you're frozen in death, right? You can neither see, you can neither hear, you can neither speak, and the hands that once worked don't work, the feet that once walked don't walk, the things that you used to do. Death has gotten a grip now, you can't do it anymore. Then not only are you dead, but then the decomposition takes place, where the form breaks down. This is why in our world of Islam, we don't cremate. We don't believe that the righteous should burn. That fire is for the wicked. But when the Jews and the Muslims leave this life, they get the body and they wash it and they oil it and they wrap it and they put the body to the earth. Come back 60 days later or less, his bones. Because the decomposition brings the flesh back to the earth. The bone is the stone of the body. It can last a pretty long while because it's like stone. But you and I have decomposed. Our form is gone. So when you see graves unearthed, whether it's in Bosnia, Herzegovina, whether it's in Iraq, when you see a body that's been in the ground a long time, you have to have a special science to find out who that is because the form of it that you could recognize at the point of death, you can't recognize after it has been in the grave for a long time. Is that true? And what am I saying? Since you've been to funerals and you've seen the effect of the loss of the breath of life, and you do expect, by your knowledge of having gone to funerals, that one day somebody's coming to ours. Hello. Since you know that, then the life that we have should be so precious to us, and the expectancy of the hereafter should be so powerful with us that we want to do what we can do that will allow us to see the life after death. Now I'm going to go to the Bible and the Quran to talk about death. Now. 
when Allah in the Bible created Adam, what did the Bible say? He created Adam in his image and after his likeness. And he breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living soul. And he made Adam master the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and every creeping thing that crawls upon the earth. This is the way he made Adam. Now, when you tell me that you made Adam to rule the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and every creeping thing that crawls, and you made him in your image and after your likeness, and you refer to him biblically as the, not a, the glory of God. The sun, as magnificent as it is, is not the glory of God. Neither the moon, nor the stars, nor the seas, the rivers, the lakes, or the oceans, or the mountains. But the glory of God is the human being. That means that the human in potential is to the universe as the sun is. He has the capacity to master whatever God created. Since he's in the image of God and the likeness of God, then he can become a master of everything that God created. Where are you in this? Some of you can't call a dog. The dog rebels. Come here, Fido. He go another way. Some of you can't call your children. And they respond. But here, when Allah made a man, from the Bible's point of view, he made him as the glory of God. But something happened. The Bible says the serpent, more subtle than any beast of the field, caused Adam to slip to fall. What does slip? The Quran uses the word slip. Cause his foot to slip. Now you, you slip. You slip sometime, haven't you? That can be disastrous if you humpty dumpty. Sometimes you have a slip and you never recover. Here's Adam being deceived now, he falls. And how did he fall? What was the nature of his fall? The scripture says that the serpent told Adam, if you eat of this tree, you're not going to die. Your eyes are going to come open and you'll be like God. But he was already like God. God couldn't say, I'm going to make you in my image and likeness and you're not like in some respect. Even though the Quran says there's none like him, it don't mean that you can compare yourself to the one who created you. But it means that you have like powers that he gives you. Ah, listen, because we're going deep now. Look, he says, uh, you're not going to die. Your eyes are going to come open. But after he ate from that tree, he heard God 
walking in the garden. Oh, Lord. You know how when you do wrong and you hear the footsteps of somebody coming that can expose you? That's some rough stuff. <laughs> a liar and a thief and a murderer is always looking for who's going to expose my evil. Okay. He hears God walking and he grabs him a leaf and he tries to cover himself. But he's naked now. But he's trying to cover his nakedness. Naked here don't mean the dude didn't have clothes on. As a person is naked, you see them. Please, we don't want to see you, but what I'm trying to say is that nakedness means you're exposed. So for Adam to be naked in the garden, it means he had no sin. And he had no shame. See, everybody that commits sin has some shame. What did I do that for? Ooh, Lord, I hope that ain't exposed to the light. That's shame. See, but Adam didn't have that. He was naked, but meaning he had nothing to hide. But once he disobeyed God, then there was a punishment that had to happen to him. And what was that punishment? That Adam died in his great spiritual, intellectual powers. He died here. And when you die here, see, then your physical body suffers from a mental body that is deprived of divine light. <laughs> you with me? Yes, That's the Bible. Now here's the Quran. Allah creates Adam in the Quran. And he calls him Khalifa. What does that mean? I don't know Arabic, so I have to rely on those who do know. So the people who know Arabic say that Khalifa means one who stands, listen, in the place of another as a successor. You didn't hear me. Well, from the Quranic viewpoint, when God created Adam, he created Adam to stand in his place. You can't stand in the place of God and be some weak-minded, non-knowledgeable person. He was so wise after God breathed into him physically and breathed into him spiritually the wisdom to master creation. Then he told him the names of the angels. And he told him, go and ask the angel, you know, to tell you their names. And the angels couldn't respond because they didn't know. He said, well, Adam, you tell them. So Adam was put on a level above the angels. But the Quran says Satan made him slip. Now, what we have seen of human beings, we are so far away from what God intended when he created the human being. Listen to me good now. 
till when they ask you, when they say, how much of your brain do you use? And they say, you know, you're good if you use 10%. In this world, if you use 10%, you're a genius. You make an airplane with 10%. You go out in space with 10%. What could you do if you use 50%? What would you look like? if you could use 100% of what God gave you, then you would understand the reality of God walking in man. You didn't hear me, but I want you to listen. You have never seen God. You have never seen a man that is using 100% of his brain power. Well, I've seen the prophet, our star. A prophet is nothing but a prophet. Yeah, they heard me. Why do you think no prophet has been successful? in planting righteousness and making it grow on this earth. Talk to me. Excuse me, I'm going to try not to get excited because I, I got to remember I've been fasting and I don't want to I don't want to overdo it. But I'm excited. Listen to me. God, I missed that last point. A prophet has not been successful in overcoming Satan. Not one, including Prophet Muhammad. Now don't, don't argue with me. Look at your world of Islam and tell me that the prophet has overcome Satan. Satan got the world of Islam in his hip pocket. And a few out of that world have escaped Satan. But they are weak. Talk to me, Christian. Talk to me, uh, brothers and sisters. Jesus overcame Satan. Where's your power? I'm all right. I'm trying to say something to us. A prophet cannot defeat a God. It takes a God to defeat a God. Did you see the movie Children of a Lesser God? You may not want to accept this, but the white man is a God. Not the God. He's the God of his world. Talk back to me. You and I are living in the white man's world. Yes, you helped him, Sam. You a good helper, Sam. But you help the white man to build a world that is diametrically opposed to the nature in which you are created. You help him produce death for you. Oh, we're going to talk today. I'm not going to let you spooky-minded people get away today.
The devil is a spirit. But he's a spirit manifested in a human being. This is why the Quran said, don't follow the footsteps of the devil. Well, if he got footsteps, that guy, he got a foot. He's making a path. All right, all right. Now look, if death, that the Bible and Quran are talking about, is not physical death. <laughs> but it is when you rebel against God, the powers that you are capable of. Here, as the glory of God, these powers begin to shut down. Not only do they shut down, but the human being who is in rebellion against God begins to decompose. Decompose in your social community life. Decompose in your moral life, in your intellectual life. Decompose in your economic life and your behavior is so funky that you stink in the nostrils of God and you stink in your own society where some of your brothers and sisters want to get as far away from you as they can because they smell a stench coming up from us. You are not a Christian. You are not a Muslim. You are the decomposed remains of what could be, what might be, and what ultimately will be the decomposed remains that's why we can talk the religion but where's our practice we can talk up Jesus till we have a fit but what kind of fit is Jesus having looking at our behavior Look at the church. Look at the mosque. Look at the synagogue. What are we practicing? Come on, come on, come on. We go say our prayers. Yeah, that's fine. That's, that's a step. But hell, if prayer does not lead to practice of a high moral character, a life of character, then your prayer is an empty prayer. Talk to me. I'm saying something. Now, I want to open the Bible again. I want to talk about how the Bible says death and how the Bible says life. Paul is talking. Paul says, as by one man sin entered into the world, not one spirit, one man. Now human beings been doing sin. It's natural. Sin is as natural as breathing. You never taught your child to lie, did you? Come on, baby, let me show you how to lie. Did you ever do that to your child? How come they know? 
Every one of you that lied, raise your hands. Now, did, did mama teach you to lie? Hell no. Where was the lie? It came up out of you when you felt insecure about something you did or failed to do and you wanted to cover that up so that you wouldn't get a whooping or be disgraced or be whatnot or whatnot or whatnot. Then you said, no, I didn't do that. Two years old and you can lie? See, but that's a little small sin. The Quran is talking about a sin that is a terrible sin. A sin that causes the human to set up a rival or a partner with God. That's the worst of sins. And from that comes all the other sins. Now look at this. As by one man sin entered into the world and death came by sin, all men have sinned, so death has passed to all men. So all of us are under death. We live in the valley of the shadow of death. And we fear much evil because we don't know who's with us and that's why you buying weapons because you think you need that to protect yourself. It ain't a gun, baby. You need God, the true God in your life. Now look, that's, then it says, as by one man sin entered into the world and death came by sin, so by one man shall all be made alive. Now if the death is spiritual, mental, moral, social, political, and economic. And it came because a man came in the world and made a system that was diametrically opposed to the order of God. And all of us fell victim to this man and his system of things. So death has passed to all of us. You may not like this. But the Caucasian has ordered a world that is diametrically opposed to God and the nature in which God created everything. I can prove it in two minutes. Who is the author of freedom? You have to say God. Because everything that he created, he authored its freedom. Who is the author of justice? God. Because everything that he created and freed, he allowed it to justify its existence by being what he created it to be. Who is the author of equality? It is God. Because whether you are an atom or a planet, as long as you function under the law under which you are created, then the atom is equal to the planet which is composed of billions of atoms, trillions of atoms. Now look at the white man's world. He deprives people of freedom. He deprives people of justice. He deprives people of equality. And if it looks like you are going to become a possessor of light, 
or knowledge that will truly free those whom ignorance has allowed him to enslave, then he will murder you, he will lie on you, he will bring you into his courts and sentence you to prison, all because you want to free people with the light of truth that he hides so that you will never find freedom, justice, and equality. As by one man sin entered into the world and death came by sin, all have sinned, therefore death has come to all men. The Bible says we were born in sin. What is sin? Transgression of the law. So if you're born under transgression, then shaped in iniquity, then you are already dead, brother. We're dead, man. Look at you. Look in the mirror. Take a good look at yourself. Look at the thoughts that you think and the actions that you do and the words you speak, that's the death of a human that was created by God to be Khalifa. And look at his condition. Well, brother, I don't believe that because the Quran don't say that. Oh, but it does. Let's look at it. Here we go. Where is my Quranic verse? Yes. In the second surah, chapter, verse 258. Abraham, now we're talking about Abraham. This Abraham is one of the greatest prophets of God. In fact, all the prophets, including Jesus, bear witness to Abraham. And Muhammad, the last of the prophets, you can't say your prayers and complete your prayers without saying, O oh Allah, Bless Muhammad and his followers as you blessed Abraham and his followers. And grant your favors to Muhammad and his followers as you granted your favors to Abraham and his followers. So Abraham the first, Muhammad the last, they're connected. Both are the friends of God. Now look, Jesus too. But I want you to follow this. Has you not thought of him who disputed with Abraham about his Lord because Allah had given him kingdom? When Abraham said, my Lord is he who gives life and causes to die. The one who was disputing with Abraham said, I give life and I cause death. Now stop. If you think about God arguing or Abraham arguing with white people, not you, I mean you, you do this too. But God says, I give life and I cause death. And the man said, I give life, and I cause death. Now, some of you exercise that kind of power in your gang banging. You have your little pea shooter, and there's a little girl on the porch playing who deserves a chance to live. But you 
who have a sperm that gives life also possess the power to kill, to take life. But God was talking on a grand scale. I give life, and I cause death. And the one arguing said, well, I do that too. But look how God answers. Surely Allah causes the sun to rise from the east. So do you make it rise from the west? Thus he who disbelieved was confounded. And Allah guides not the unjust people. Now wait a minute. Why would Abraham change from life to death and the cause of both to go to God making the sun to rise from the east? Can you make it rise from the west? That's big in the scheme of resurrection. Now follow me, follow me, follow me. Or like him who passed by a town and it had fallen in upon its roofs. And he said, when will Allah give it life after its death? He's talking about a town that had decayed and fallen away to nothing. And then he asked the question, when will Allah give this town life after its death? Giving you pictures of death and life. Now look at this. And that we may make thee a sign to men and look at the bones, how we set them together, then clothe them with flesh. So when it became clear to him, he said, I know that Allah is possessor of power over all things. We're still talking about life and death. Now Abraham, the friend of God, asked God a question. Listen to this. Abraham said, my Lord, Show me how you give life to the dead. Now this is God's prophet asking him to give him, show me, show me. And look at what God says. He said, do you not believe? Abraham said, yes, I believe, but that my heart may be at ease. And Allah said, then take four birds, then tame them to incline to you, then place on every mountain a part of them, then call them they will come to thee flying and know that Allah is mighty and wise. Now let's wrap it up. We are concentrated on the cemetery and the dead coming out of the cemetery. But Allah is giving us three beautiful pictures. I give life, I cause death. Well, I do that too. I make the sun rise from the east. Can you make it rise from the west? The dude was confounded. He, he can't talk. Now, what does that have to do with giving life to the dead? Come on now. Then he says, 
He passed by a town that had fallen in on its roof. And the question was asked, when will Allah give this town life after its death? It's a town now, a material thing that had rotted and had fallen in from the roof. And then the third is, show me how you give life to the dead. He said, take four birds, tame them. That's power. Take some birds, tame them, make them inclined to you. Then call them or place them on every mountain, then call them, and they will come to thee flying. Know that Allah is mighty and wise. As by one man sin came in, and death came by sin, so by one man shall life come, and all men that were dead shall live. In the book of Revelations, he says, a man talking, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. It's a person, a human being, in whom God has deposited a light and that man, I start from the third thing first. He, he takes humans out of clay and forms them into a bird. Then he tames the bird. What do you mean tame it? When something is a savage or uncivilized or wild, You have to have skill to tame a wild creature. So Abraham tamed this bird and make it not inclined to somebody else. Make it inclined to you. Then take the birds and put them on four mountains. Take them in pots. I don't know whether he meant cut them in parts. But he said, place on every mountain a part of them, then call them. So a part could mean if it's four, you put one part here, one part there. But it said, put a part of them on every mountain. Every mountain. That's what the Quran says. So you can't put four birds on every mountain. So you have to break those birds up into pieces and put them on every mountain. This is so great. That's the third one. The second one is a town that fell in from the roof. Now you know, when a building falls in from the roof, man, that's a fall, brother. Remember how the World Trade went down? It didn't go from the bottom. It went from high up. And when it came down, brother, it took everything down with it. So what's going on in your roof? Or has your roof fallen in? Don't tell me. At your town, your house, your family, your community has not fallen in from the roof. That means the leaders are sick. The leaders are blind. The leaders don't have good character. The leaders are weak and wicked. Bought and paid for by Satan. 
so your community reflects that you have blind leadership. The black community all over America has fallen in from the roof. Our communities are destroyed. Can you give it life after its death? Then he said, I give life, I cause death. And the enemy said, I do that too. He said, but I make the sun to rise from the east. Can you make it rise from the west? In conclusion, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, if the sun that rises in the east, God would make it rise from the west. Does it mean that the physical sun would reverse itself? He could do that if he wanted to, but that's not what it means. Every prophet that has come into the world has come out of the East. But he didn't mention prophet. He mentioned sun, light. He said, I make the sun rise in the East. Can you make it rise from the West? He is God now talking that he's going to raise from the west one with light that is like the sun. So the Jesus you're looking for is not in the east. The Jesus you're looking for is going to come up out of the west from a people blind, deaf, dumb, and dead. Take it or leave it. Now look, here's a town that fell in on the roof. I'm almost finished. Here's a group of people that have died mentally, morally, spiritually, socially, politically, and economically. We are not 10% of the use of our brain, maybe one-tenth of 1%. Our sisters know how to shake. You learn that from a baby. Come on, baby, shake, honey. Shake, baby. Do it, girl. <laughs> yeah. But they have not learned the wisdom of God. They have not learned the greatness of themselves. Satan has made our women into temptresses. Satan has made our women to be destroyers of our nation. It's not your fault. Oh, I'm not saying it again to please a masochistic male ego that don't know how to handle a woman. So you enjoy it if it looks like I'm going to beat up on women. Hell no. Satan took you and me out of the equation as her real counterpart. And Satan became the man in her life. You want to kill somebody? What you going to kill us over? Some paper, see? Who face on the paper? The white man, huh? Do you give this to her to take care of your babies? Or is she on welfare? asking the white man to do what you don't want to do. No, 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 no. 
Listen, listen. We are a destroyed male. But our women are also destroyed because Satan has pulled you out of your natural role. How can you respect a man that can't perform? What is a man supposed to do? The Quran said men are the maintainers of women. How you gonna maintain a woman dumb? The first thing you gotta do to maintain a woman is to have wisdom, not money, wisdom. When you are wise, in the way of God, you can maintain a woman who is not your woman, but she's the woman of God. Listen, listen, listen. Look, brother, right now, our sisters make more money than we do. Satan got this thing reversed, see? She can't stay home and take care of the babies that you give her or we give her. Because you ain't making enough money. So she got to work. So when she works to bring in money and it's more money than your money, she's growing testicles. And you growing eggs. That's why you quick to act like a sissy. Because you are gradually being taken away from what a man is. And that's why you call your house a crib. Because mentally you are a baby playing games with life. But in the meantime, look at you. You educate. Your man is ignorant. You going to school. He going to the corner or to jail or to the crack house. But he's not trying to better himself. The sisters got to better themselves because you and I have failed them. So the sister said, well, hell, I, I, I can't depend on no man. That's deep. Because God made her to depend on us and made us to depend on him. But she can't depend on us. So she's depending on herself. So then you hear it in her voice. Yes. What you want? Well, honey, you know, you know, I, I, I want a little soup or something to eat. Well, hell, get it yourself. I'm working just like you. Can't you put something in the microwave, fool? Now, you know she done had it now when she talked like that. Then look at you. Uh, oh, no damn woman talk to me like that. Now, you're going to assert a manhood that you don't have here by trying to assert it here. And that's why there's so much spousal abuse going on in our community. Satan is responsible for this. There's a dude. He don't believe in no Bible. The Bible said, spare the rod, spoil the child. How many of you have ever gotten a whooping from your parents? Raise your hand.
And let me tell you something. I heard my brother say last night, he don't like to talk a lot. So when he get that backside, he put it on it one time. Mm -hmm. And then they remember. I think that, you know, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, oh, you remember that? He said, well, I must have done it right. I impressed something on your mind through your behind. <laughs> now, today, your children tell you, you better not hit me. I call 911 on you. So my brother said, I take them down in the basement. Mm -hmm. come on, come on. And when I get finished with them, say, if you got strength enough to call 911, help, <laughs> help yourself. You yeah. now look at me. <laughs> you challenging my right to discipline, not abuse. There's a difference between discipline and abuse. None of us have the right to abuse our children but we do have the right to discipline them. So, my family, the resurrection of the dead starts with a call. Did not you hear my reminder calling to you from among yourselves, asking you to submit to Allah, your Lord? and to set up no God beside him, did not my reminder come to you? See, it starts with a call. Here's God calling you. My Lord, he calls me. He calls me by the thunder. I hear him call deep within my soul. I ain't got long to stay in this grave of ignorance. I heard a call. I heard a call 47 years ago from a man who said he came to resurrect us from death. I was a musician and I was good at what I did, but I heard a call and I came forth like a piece of clay that had been malformed and he broke me down in my old form and began to build me into a different kind of human being. Farrakhan does not function like a snake, a serpent, or a dragon. Neither do I function as a beast, lying in wait for somebody to take advantage of their weakness. But as when you open a book, it looks like a bird. When God blesses you to come into the light of wisdom, you begin to take on wings. Not wings in the sense that wings sprout from your body, but wings in the sense that you can rise up above any situation and become its master. Not only did he, Elijah Muhammad, resurrect me, you can't deny all of you have been affected by Malcolm X. And Elijah Muhammad awakened him. He was 
16 years in the process of resurrection when he departed from his teacher. He was my mentor. I never met a man more disciplined than Brother Malcolm. I think that I'm fortunate to have come up under such a magnificent student of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Brother Malcolm was the first man to give me a holy Quran. Brother Malcolm was the first man to give me a hundred amazing facts about the Negro by J.A. Rogers. He gave me all of J.A. Rogers' books to study. He's the first man to give me a book called 15 Million Negroes, $15 billion. He was the first man to teach me how to pray. And he was the first man to teach me how to fast. It grieves me that he departed from this life. But I'm grateful to Allah for what he gave me. And the last conversation that I had with him in that blue Oldsmobile that sits over at Malcolm X College he said to me these words, Brother, one day my enemies will be yours. And he named some. I'm not going to say what he said in that case because they did become my enemies. But I overcame them. He said, I wish it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example for you. He was 13 years in that process. I'm 47 years in that process. I'm not yet a graduate student, but what I have can give life to every dead person on this planet. Because not only did he give me life, he taught me how to give life to others. So the hereafter, he said, hereafter what? It means here. After the destruction of the power and authority of the Caucasian people to rule. When their power is broken and they no longer can hold sway over human beings then the human being that is from God will hear the call and respond and come to life. The white man's world is like snow. You don't get snow until you have 32 degrees Fahrenheit or less and the snow covers the earth and sometimes the drifts are so great you don't think that you'll ever see spring again but when the earth turns in its relationship to the sun and when we turn 
in our relationship to God and the light that he has sent down then the ice and the snow begin to melt into life-giving water and the water goes down and germinates the seed of the kingdom of God which is in us and then a new person comes up from the grave of ignorance. White people themselves are sick of their world. They, but they want to be the masters of the new order. That's not for them. The masters of the new order is to be the stone that the builders rejected. That's you. That's me. That's us. Now, I'm a student as a reflection of my teacher. Now, look at what the enemy has put on me for the last 20 years. <laughs> I haven't with it. Or some of my detractors would say, he's a kinda gentler Farrakhan, you know. <laughs> like I've compromised the teachings. No. No. But I realize what he taught me when Issy and Udom made the book Black Nationalism and styled the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as a black nationalist, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did not argue with him, but he said to me, Oh, brother, they call me a black nationalist. He said, but black is not national. He said, black is universal. He said, for everything started in darkness and came out into the light. So what was he telling me? The first phase of the teaching was black. Black in a physical sense. The black man this, the black man that, the black man the other, the black man, black man, black man, black man. Till we got so black. Till we missed the universality of blackness. See, when what you have is universal, it fits everybody. See, when my dear sister, Dr. Frances Cress Wellesley, starts to teach on white supremacy and its effect on black people universally she can teach that same teaching and show the negative effect that it had on white people because what they taught now is coming back at them because as thou hast done so shall it be done so now what we want is the life of the hereafter. Life of sport and play. Well, I love sport. I, I, I do. If there's a fight on, I'll do my best to try and see it. I just happen to like boxing. Now, I don't necessarily care for baseball, but during the World Series, I might look at it, maybe at the seventh game, you know. I can't tell you that I don't like basketball, especially when Michael was playing and, and the Bulls were reigning supreme. I, I had to turn my TV on to see what the Bulls are doing. I can't tell you I'm not a tennis fan. 
but when my sister is playing, I watch tennis. And I've never been a golf fan, but when Tiger was hitting that little white ball in the cup, I said, I, I, I got to look at this. But the life of this world, see, it's transitory. It's short-lived. You can't live your life for the pleasure of this world. There's a greater pleasure than the pleasure that this world offers. I'm finished, but this is where I want to stop. With the life of the hereafter. Here after what? In your brain exists a government. You govern your body by what you have in your head. Revolution is the overthrow of false government and returning it to its original state. So the first government that has to be overthrown is the government in your head. It has not done well by you. It has not allowed you to satisfy your needs. Your government is messed up. But it takes power to overthrow a government. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the hereafter for my followers starts in this life. Well, how did you mean that? Here. After I have been washed of the white man's false ideas and concepts here in my head after he is gone and God has replanted a new idea that brings up a new way of thinking let this mind be in you the same that was in Christ Jesus. You can have the mind of God if you dedicate yourself to reading the word that he revealed to Muhammad. This is a conversation that God had with a man. And you and I are allowed to listen. Now you listen in on a conversation that God is talking to another man, don't you think you'll come away wise? That's how powerful the Quran is. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, if you will come under the law of righteousness, it will produce love among you. What's the problem with us? We don't love each other. Why don't we love each other? Because we have not submitted to a law that causes me to treat you like I want to be treated myself. So then you can't produce love with a white dress or a bow tie. You can't produce love with a kufi or a jalabia or a beard or clean-shaved face. These are outward appearances that could betray something different that's going on on the inside. But if we, from the inside, submit it to the law of righteousness, then love would come up among us. And that love 
would bring unity and peace and unlimited progress. So the Quran says in the hereafter, you won't hear any vain discourse. Just peace, peace, peace. And it gives you a physical picture on raised couches with people never altering in age. Do you know what it's like to live in a world where you can't trust nobody? That's a lot of stress. You go, you take your car to the mechanic. You're not a mechanic. The dude gets under there and tells you this is wrong, that is wrong, the other is wrong. Hardly nothing is wrong. But he's robbing you. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you went to a Muslim mechanic who put righteousness ahead of profit? And he tells you exactly what is wrong and doesn't try to rob you. Can you imagine the kind of trust you have? I go to a Muslim who loves righteousness to buy a house. And they're not trying to lie to me about the price. I go to a Muslim lawyer who prides himself in the law of God above the law of man. And I can turn my back and know that my interest is being protected. Go to a Muslim doctor, a Muslim architect, a Muslim plumber, electrician, or a true Christian who will not cheat and steal. That's the beginning of a heavenly life among us. That life we can have right now. You don't have to wait. Let the resurrection process begin in you. That you're going to be a better you. In the Quran, it talks about three stages of human development. The first stage is the animalistic stage, where we act like we act now. That's an animal. The second stage is a moral stage, where the self-accusing spirit begins to tell you, you shouldn't have did that. The third stage is when you are so in tune with God. I forget the name that it used in Arabic, um, but it has something to do with paradise, Jannah, but it's when the soul of the person is so in oneness with God that the person reflects the attributes of God. Then that is a soul at rest. Well pleasing to thy Lord and well pleased. That's what we can get in this life. So believers, you said we're going to do this. In six months time, we not only must fast and pray, we're going to work so that Allah, as well as his messenger and the believers, may see our work. We have to build not a mosque, but a nation. But a nation where our people can find expression. You don't force them to be a Muslim. There's no compulsion in religion. The right way is clearly distinct from error, but righteousness is what we want to practice, not fighting over labels. Listen, listen, listen. We want to establish nine ministries. A ministry of 
information, a ministry of art and culture, a ministry of education, a ministry of defense, a ministry of science and technology, a ministry of health, Ministry of Justice. We got to stop relying on the courts of the enemy. When we offend one another, we have to set up among ourselves a court system that we have, that we respect, that we settle each other's disagreements with justice. And all of these ministries will be under the governance of the spiritual. Everything comes from God. You cannot take God out of anything and be successful. So I'm asking for resumes of all of those who really want to help build a nation whatever your skill is. I'm asking every one of the ministers to look in your mosques and find a person whose desire it is to become a writer or reporter for the Final Call newspaper. If we're in 120 or more cities, and in every city we have a reporter, then that means we can spread the news of what's happening far and wide. We have to increase the circulation of the paper and make it the instrument that our people read for enlightenment. So I'm asking in all of the mosques that are listening today, if you would like to be a reporter, a writer for the final call, give your name to your minister, and we will be coming in your area to train you. We have to focus on education. We have a school here. We can't let the school die from the lack of attention and care. We have an opportunity to escape the corruption of a declining educational system. America is 18th in the developed world in mathematics and science, which means her civilization is going down. This is a sinking ship. So the book says, come out of her, my people. Come on. We can build an educational system superior to anything that exists with the knowledge of God, the knowledge of self, the knowledge of others, science and mathematics at its core. Help me to do that. So in this next six months, we'll probably have a constitutional convention where we will take a look at the present constitution of the Nation of Islam, which was fashioned by myself and others when we first started rebuilding. We need to look at it again in light of today's world and the needs and refashion it. I guarantee you this six months will not be just fasting and prayer but it will be work like we never worked before internally 
and externally. So my family, I want us to create the beginning of the hereafter right now. I want, listen, listen, listen. I want us to practice respect for one another. And every one of us should recommit ourselves to the law of righteousness. And this will stop slander, backbiting, stealing, lying, abuse, and love will come up out of you. And people will want to be where you are because to inhale an atmosphere of love and freedom and justice and equality and progress, everybody wants that. That's what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wanted. So take this thought home with you. There were some sick people in the time of Jesus that had a devil. And the disciples worked all day and couldn't, couldn't heal the man. So they found Jesus and said, Jesus, we tried. Would you? And in an instant, Jesus healed him. So when the disciples got Jesus alone, they said, Master, why was it that we couldn't heal that man? And Jesus said, O oh, ye of little faith, if you had faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you could say to the mountain, be removed, and it would be so. And you could say to the sycamore tree, be uprooted, and be planted in the depth of the sea, and it would be so. In another part, this person was possessed of demons. And the disciples went to work on that person and couldn't do anything. So they came to Jesus. At least they were intelligent. When you can't do something, it's good to know that you can go to somebody who know how to do this thing. So they knew Jesus had this power. So they went to the master and said, look, uh, we've been working on this fella, and we can't seem to cast out this demon. Jesus came instantly, cast the demon out. The disciples said, Master, why couldn't we do this? He said, this kind of demon can only be cast out by fasting and prayer. Now, each of us is possessed of a demon. Y'all know what your demon is. Maybe you got more than one. Maybe we got two, three, four, five. One person came to Jesus, has seven devils. That didn't stop Jesus. But look at what he said. Come out of her. And when they were coming out, they were cussing Jesus. Why are you persecuting us before time? It's time now for the enemy's world to come down. It's time now for demons to be cast out of our people. It's time now. But you can't do it if you're weak in faith. And the kind of demons that our people got is going to take some fasting and prayer and study. And then we can say like Jesus said to Lazarus when he came out 
bound and blindfolded. He said, loose him, Satan, and let him go. That's the beginning of your resurrection. Let that enemy loose you. Let you go and let God resurrect you from death and let us become a society of living people filled with love and mercy and kindness to each other and to our people. Thank you for listening and may Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum.